This is not merely to prove it. It is also to do another thing, which is the whole work of art. What is art? Art is what Christians call the process of incarnation, the making of the divine word into the flesh, the expression in a material form of vision. And to do that is very difficult. On a uh, hundred micrograms of LSD, you may very well have seen the vision of God in a dirty old ashtray. You, can you imagine that that's possible? But it is because what is an ashtray? Ashes, the decay, the falling apart, the burning away, the turning of uh, alive, more or less alive, or at least moist leaves of tobacco into dust. And as you begin to think about that from a sort of certain point of view, it becomes a parable of the process of existence. What is this turning of everything into dust? At first sight, it looks as if it were a, a kind of a doom. Everything is just going into dust, 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 and blowing away. And you realize that's what you're doing. And by smoking these cigarettes, you're slowly committing suicide, giving yourself lung cancer or something. Then you may remember the words of C.G. Jung, that life is an incurable disease with a very bad prognosis, which lingers on for years and invariably ends with death. Everything you do is bad for you. Like the little boy, four years old, who'd got sunburn, and his skin was peeling, and he looked in the mirror and said, so young, wearing out already <laughs> you know all energy wears you out everything is going into dust but as I was suggesting this morning when you understand that life is that, that your birth was being kicked off a precipice that you're going to ashes remember this ceremony in the Catholic Church on Ash Wednesday and everybody kneels before the altar and the priest puts cigarette ash, or rather the burnt palm leaves, previous Palm Sunday on their foreheads and said, Remember, O oh man, the dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. You remember the poem of G.K. Chesterton about dust? What a vile dust, the preacher said. He thought the whole world woke. He goes on. He talks about everything being a kind of trembling dust. And he ends up by saying, uh, talking of that final day, uh, no, not the final day, the first day when God was with the angels, when God to all his paladins by his own splendor swore to make a fairer face than heaven of dust and nothing more. So it is to the, to the extent, you see, there's a, there's a kind of a paradox in all this, to the extent that you completely accept the dissolution of everything into dust, that by doing that, you let go of that clinging to permanence, to yourself, to security, which releases all the energies of life. To the degree, the formula then is, to the degree that you are willing to become dust, to that degree you are alive. And that's how a person could see the vision of God in an ashtray. Now, I've spent a few minutes taking some trouble with words to explain the ashtray as a vehicle of the vision of God. Now, if you're a painter, it's not just enough to take a pedestal. I mean, so let's say you're a sculptor, uh, you're a person who presents objects of art. You can't just get away with putting a nice walnut cube, beautifully polished, filthy ashtray on it, enclose it in a glass case, put a label on it and say, beatific vision. And that'll shock people a little bit. That might give them pause. But if you're really skillful, you will understand how to paint an old ashtray or photograph it in such a way that people's hearts will stop. Say, look at that. And then, but to do that, it will be necessary for you to show all the individual little pepper, pepper and salt pepper, patterns in ash as a collection of tiny jewels, which is how you can see them. But you'll have to represent that and carry it out and bring it through. Just in the same way as the people who painted Persian miniatures, which are painted jewelry, would look at trees and grasses and rocks 
and suddenly show them as full of interior light, enchanted, divine, by a very skillful technique. But you have to have that technique to bring it through. Some for some possession, some complete mastery of an artistic technique is necessary for the bringing through of the vision. So then our young people have stumbled on uh, a key to the vision, psychedelic chemicals and such things. But they will not be able to bring it through unless they also have the skills. And therefore the, uh, the attitude of the older generation in this situation will naturally be one of great concern and worry as to what this kind of easy mysticism, too easy mysticism, shall we say, is going to bring about. All this has become terribly popular for the simple reason that human beings need religion, are starved for it, and that the churches have not delivered. They have not delivered the experience. Therefore, uh, alternatives are being explored. It's quite natural. But you, as I, I repeat, you are rightly and properly concerned as to what will be the outcome. And the only way to make a good job of it is instead of saying, suppress the whole thing, which never works anyway, is to emphasize the point, all right, all right, you've done this. This is what you've seen. You've had these experiences. But there is a great deal more to it than that. In my own study of these kind of experiences, I could not have really, really enjoyed them unless I had before that time been trained in all sorts of ways, not only to um, understand the doctrines and the symbolism of religions, mythologies, but also simply to speak and write. Because unless you know the art of language, or you know the art of numbers, or whatever it is, whatever is the vehicle through which you express yourself, you can't bring it forth. It's one of the great puzzles of life. Consider people who've had a great love affair. Dante and Beatrice. Everybody knows about that love affair because Dante could express it so gorgeously. Supposing there's some people who've had a love affair and all the guy could ever say to the girl was, uh, mm, uh, uh. <laughs> this is a real puzzle because is that guy any less in love with the girl than Dante was with Beatrice? Perhaps it was the same degree of love. But obviously, the, 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 the effect for mankind of Dante's love was far greater than the guy who can only say, <clears throat> see? One, they, they both go into the paradise. They both go into the beatific vision. But one brings it back and shares it. And this is the distinction which is made in Buddhism between two kinds of Buddhas. There's the Buddha who attains nirvana for himself. He's called a Pratyeka Buddha. And there is the Buddha who crosses and sees nirvana and comes back to share it with the whole universe, with everybody, with all sentient beings. He's called Bodhisattva. And it so turns out that in the literature of Mahayana Buddhism, Pratyeka Buddha is almost a term of abuse, whereas a Bodhisattva is the ideal form of man. Because the Bodhisattva realizes that he does not have the vision, really. If, well, let me put it in this way, I don't have it if you don't have it. Because I have it only to the extent that I can give it away. That I can give it up and to, up and to all others. Thank you.